Hello and welcome everyone to Varsity Tutors Virtual Summer Camp. I'm Brian and if it's the 2nd of July, that means, check me on the math, we are two days away from the 4th of July and of course that means fireworks. So if you're fired up for fireworks the way I am, you'll be thrilled that we've got TikTok's most famous chemistry teacher, Phil Cook here, to teach us how fireworks work. Now, before we get started, want to make sure you guys know we want to keep this interactive. Even if you're just yelling ooh and ah at the fireworks displays or indoor fireworks displays that Phil's gonna do, we've got that chat panel you can see right next to the video stream here. Uh, we wanna hear from you. So um, ask Phil questions at the end. We're gonna have about 10 minutes to, uh, to take some Q and A and answer anything that he didn't do with experiments. He'll be ready to talk to you about. He's also gonna ask you some questions to find out what you know about fireworks. And so be ready to answer those questions. We've got a polling tool and chat there. Also have a camera nearby. If you guys like that sharp uh, lab coat that Phil's got on right now, you're gonna be entered to win your very own autographed and sized for you uh, lab coat just like that. If you take a picture with Phil toward the end of class here, we'll tell you when it's time, upload it to Instagram and tag Phil and tag Varsity Tears. So um, all the, the great things about the 4th of July, there's prizes, there's fireworks, there's science. Um, if you know Phil like I do, you know that this class is going to be a blast. So Phil, Take it away, welcome to Varsity Tutors. Thanks for having me, Brian. I can't tell you guys how, how excited I am that you're all here. Thanks for joining us virtually. I hope to show you some stuff that will blow your socks off a little bit, teach you some things about some fireworks and get us ready to celebrate the 4th of July and maybe tell the people that we might be around socially distanced how they work. So if we could bring on the agenda, let's go through what we're gonna talk about today. I've got a demonstration for you first, just to pique your interest and to start our conversation about pyrotechnics, because that's what fireworks are all about. Pyrotechnics is just a word that relates to fireworks. So our first section is going to be all about pyrotechnics, technics, and it's called, let's turn up the heat. From there, we're going to take a more traditional approach and look at gunpowder and look at propellants and explosives. Fundamentally, how and why do we use gunpowder the way that we do in fireworks? From there, we start to look at colors. How can we make fireworks explode in brilliant ways? How can we make fireworks do exactly what we want them to do and not what we don't? Finally, I've got a little challenge for you, a fun little presentation where you get to make the call and tell me if you can apply what you've learned. So without any further ado, and then after that, of course, we're gonna take some time for some selfies together and we'll answer some of your questions. Let's get to that demonstration. Now, you'll see me switch a little bit as we go through this lesson today between my camera view and a camera view that's in my fume hood. Uh, something that's of paramount importance is to understand that a lot of what we're doing today is not safe to do at the proximity that you might see me doing it without special equipment. You'll see me putting on safety glasses. You'll see me using something called a fume hood. That will remove all kinds of dangerous fumes that I wouldn't want to breathe indoors. So without further ado, I'm gonna switch the camera and I'm gonna show you this first little demonstration. So be prepared to start making some observations. So the reaction is gonna happen here in this little evaporating dish. It's made out of ceramic. To that, I'm going to add a mixture of two chemicals. The first chemical is an oxidizer. And we'll talk about what an oxidizer is in a minute, but it's called ammonium nitrate. The second chemical, is a catalyst. And again, we'll talk about what that means in a minute. It's called ammonium chloride. I've already pre-mixed them together in this container. And I'm gonna pour them into my dish. The third ingredient is an element, a metallic element. It's powdered zinc. You notice it looks kind of dull and gray, not what, not what you might anticipate when you think about a metal. Metals are usually shiny. This one's quite dull. I'm going to pour it in, and then I'm going to mix them. Now here's where we have to be careful because everything we need for the reaction at this point is present in this dish. But interestingly enough, nothing's happening. I've got it pretty thoroughly mixed too. I wonder what that tells us. Maybe you could post some questions that you have in your mind as we start to look at this final mixture. You notice it's nice and gray colored now. Hmm, it's not doing anything. I wonder if we could add something to it. Got some water nearby. I wonder if adding water would do anything. 
Take a minute and think about what you think might happen if I add just a couple of drops of water. Here we go. Did you guys see that? That was great. That was amazing. That was, that was amazing. What do you think happened? Look at those answer choices there. Tell me what you think. Do you think I was trying to trick you? Maybe that I didn't put water in there after all, even though it was labeled water? Do you think maybe I mixed it with something else? Do you think maybe it's just spontaneous combustion? Or do you think it might have something to do with a role that water might play? What answer do you think? Post your answers there in the comments. Now, I see a lot of you choosing. It looks like some of you got, okay, you know that, you know that I'm not gonna lie to you. Some of you are saying, you know, I wouldn't lie to you. I wouldn't label it water if it was gasoline. And gasoline isn't, isn't quite as clear as water is. Now, the actual answer for this particular question is D. So let's get into this a little bit more. The reaction that happens requires particles to actually be able to move. They have to be able to move to interact with one another. And in the solid state, remember all three reactants that we had there were in solid form. They couldn't react together without a little bit of mobility between them. The water dissolves the ammonium nitrate, dissolves the ammonium chloride, allows them to react together. And when they do, you saw the explosive reaction that happened. We saw a burst of flame. We saw lots of gases being produced. And I can tell you directly, I felt a lot of heat. It's what we call an exothermic reaction. It just releases energy in the form of heat and light. The products of this reaction were nitrogen, zinc oxide, and water. I can show you briefly what the products look like, the solid products. The dish is kind of warm, but I can hold it up to the camera. That's what the products look like. That's mostly zinc oxide. It's not very pure. I'm just gonna set that to the side now. And let's move on to the summary slide. So big ideas here as we start to think about fireworks, just from that demonstration. Notice how the first thing I added was an oxidizer, okay? Oxidizers are gonna be really important because fundamentally fireworks rely upon electrons exchanging between reactants in a reaction. So a pyrotechnic display is really just an outward macroscopic observation of the energy involved when electron transfer happens between reactants. Fundamentals to keep in mind, and this will be important as we go through some future, some, some future demonstrations, is fireworks are going to generally going to be composed of four of the same type of things. If we want the firework to emit a particular color of light, we have to add a color producing agent, which you'll see in the next section. We add an oxidizer. That will always be there. You'll always have an oxidizer. You'll also always have a fuel of some sort. Now that fuel could be a carbohydrate, that fuel could be a metal. I'll show you lots of different examples of fuels in the demonstrations that I have ahead for us. And then some sort of sticky binder. If you imagine a, a sparkler, the sparkler that's shown in the image right now, the materials that comprise that sparkler would just fall off of that metal rod if they didn't have a binding agent. So let's move on to section two and get into the details of how we make those fireworks to do exactly what we want, starting with how we propel them into the sky and how they explode. So we we're gonna look at what makes them fly and what makes them explode. But before we do that, I want you to think about this. In the comments, tell me what you think the correct answer is to this question. What's the key to making fireworks explode? Is it just gunpowder? Is it how fast the launch happens? Is it lots of hot expanding gas? Is it just people encouraging the reaction, saying ooh and ah? Put your answers in the comments. Let's see what you guys are saying. A lot of you seem to be choosing B. A lot of you seem, okay, I see some Cs there. I see some Ds there. Now, in reality, the reactions that we do, fireworks don't have to always contain gunpowder. There's lots of materials we can use but those gunpowder-like materials all have something in common. They have to produce lots of hot gases. But before I reveal too much, I wanna go through and show you a demonstration where 
we go back to basics and that's with gunpowder. Gunpowder gun powder has been used for thousands of years. It was traditionally, uh, it was actually the result of a mixture of initially honey, saltpeter and sulfur. Now saltpeter is just a common name for a chemical that's an oxidizer called potassium nitrate and honey contains sugar. Sugar is a fuel. So again, notice we've got those three materials. We've got a, we've got a fuel, we've got an oxidizer and then we have sulfur, which kind of acts as like a binder and allows some electron oxidation reduction to happen as well. There's, it's a pretty complicated reaction. We'll look at that reaction in more detail, but let's start with just making some gunpowder, okay? So if we're gonna make some gunpowder, if I'm gonna show you what gunpowder is made of, I think it's time that we make sure we put on our goggles again. I realized last time I didn't even show you this, but it's time to goggle up. So gunpowder, is really three simple materials. Sulfur, which is an element, element number 16 on the periodic table. In its pure form, it's yellow. I don't know if you can see that, the lights are pretty bright, but it's a yellow powder. It has a characteristic odor. You might notice the aroma that you notice when you light off a fountain during a fireworks display, the smell of gunpowder, that's often due to sulfur compounds that result as a reaction proceeds. Another important component of gunpowder is charcoal. This is charcoal made from coconut husks. Now you could just use any kind of charcoal, like wood charcoal from a fire. And I've ground it very, very fine into a black powder. The third component, our oxidizer, is potassium nitrate. This is what, when the Chinese first developed gunpowder, it, it was called saltpeter. Okay, saltpeter is a common name for potassium nitrate. Mixtures of those three components are all you need to make gunpowder and I've prepared some already in here, I'm gonna switch the camera view back into the fume hood because you might see something very interesting happen as we light off a sample of this gunpowder. Maybe you've seen it before, maybe you haven't, I don't know, but let's go do some chemistry. As we do these demonstrations, you might notice that my fume hood is gonna get increasingly more messy. That's okay. Science is messy sometimes. I'm gonna pour a nice little pile of my black powder into the fume hood. And then I'm gonna place the rest of those materials far away. I don't want anything to be close to this black powder here. Just so you can see about how much I've used. That's the sample, probably about two grams or so. And now we're going to touch it off using a little torch, a little butane torch. So here we go. Did you catch all that smoke? Did you see the color that was emitted? I'm putting on some safety gloves here so I can handle this because it's very, very exothermic. Here's what's left over after all is said and done. You notice there are some byproducts there. Right? And it definitely, if we were not doing this in a fume hood, it would have a distinct aroma. Now, you've seen it on the macro scale with your eyes. Let's go to this slide where we actually can look at it how a chemist might see things and how we actually might be able to look at this from a perspective of uh, how we represent the language of science, which is using a chemical equation. So if you look at this equation, and I'll give you a few seconds to look at it carefully. Can you spot the two gases that were produced by the reaction? Post what you think their names are in the comment section. Okay. Or if you don't know what the names are, you can always just type in the formula too. Don't worry about subscripts or anything like that. Just type in what you see. What do you think the two gases are that are produced in this reaction? Oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't take long. I see a lot of you guys are calling out carbon dioxide, CO2. That's definitely a big product in this particular reaction. And if you noticed, you know, as that reaction happened, it happened very fast and that smoke was produced in large quantities very, very quickly. Okay, I see some more comments coming in. Uh, yeah, the rest, you got the rest of that particular reaction exactly right. You've got nitrogen gas there. Nitrogen gas is a great gas because it's pretty inert, which means it's not reactive. And those two gases are what's responsible for the two things that we tend to use gunpowder for in pyrotechnics, propelling things up into the sky and making them explode. It's those hot gases that are going to be those pieces that are important to us as we start to design fireworks. 
So a couple of things just to keep in mind before we get to this next question. Notice and just keep in the back of your mind, gunpowder burns really, really hot and really, really fast. Now you could observe directly how fast it was burning. It may have been more difficult for you to actually detect the heat, but when you see sparks and flames like that, you know that it's exothermic, very hot. And those gases, because of their temperature, expand rapidly into the environment. And we use that expanding gas to propel and to cause explosions. So let me ask you this. If you wanna use gunpowder to launch a firework into the sky, what do you think you have to do? Now, I could tell you, or I could show you, and I'd much prefer showing you. So I've got a safe little demonstration that shows you this. And it's something that is not too complicated to make. Didn't take me much more than a match and a piece of aluminum foil and some tape and a bamboo skewer. Let me show you what I've got going on. So I've got a little setup here and I'm gonna set this in the fume hood in a second. A little tiny rocket that I've made. My hands shake, that's because I was never designed to be a surgeon, okay? And this little rocket is what we're going to use to investigate how we might wanna consider using those gases produced in combustion. That rocket is nothing more than a little piece of aluminum foil that I've rolled around the head of a match, just like a normal kitchen match that you might have at home. I've used some tape to make little fins, although the fins don't really matter in this case because of uh, it's not flying very far, it's constrained. And I would never do this inside unless I had something like a fume hood because this is going to get very, very hot. And I wanna show you one more thing before I switch the camera view back into the demonstration hood so that we can see what happens when I take the match head, which is right here at the tip of my little rocket. And then the rest of this body is hollow. I don't know if you can see this very well but there I'll use my forehead for some contrast. Notice how it's hollow at the end, it's open at the end. So it's closed on one end, open on the other, right? So now what I'm going to do, switch the camera view and got my rocket in frame. I'm gonna move this so that you can actually see it launch a little better. Now, what I want you to pay attention to, and if you're sitting on your couch right now or sitting at home in a comfy chair and you've, you've lost your attention for just a second, you don't want to blink or else you miss it because you're going to be paying attention right here. So I'm going to heat that portion with a torch and we're going to watch what happens. Now, don't blink or you'll miss it. Did you see that? Did you see what happened? Now, I told you it was fast, didn't I? That, that reaction, as soon as that pyrotechnic mixture inside that match head, because it is pyrotechnic related, we use compounds similar to both phosphorus, a lot of phosphorus in that match head, in this particular match head, but those can be components used in pyrotechnics as well. And that produces, just like the gunpowder, lots of hot expanding gases. So, if we go now to the, next, um, to the next slide, I wanted to take in and, and talk to you about how design matters and answer a question that I alluded to, but I never directly addressed. So if we're going to use propellants or gunpowder or any kind of pyrotechnic mixture that results in the production of a lot of hot expanding gases, you have to understand two things. If you give the gas an exit, that gas is going to shoot out of it at an extremely high velocity. It's the fundamental idea behind rocketry. Rockets have engines that produce a lot of gas very, very quickly. The nozzle of the rocket directs the, the force of the gases shooting out in the opposite direction. And just like action and reaction, according to Newton's third law, for every action, the action would be gases shooting out of the rocket. The reaction is those gases pushing the rocket skyward. So if we want to make a, a rocket propel, you just need to direct that flow of hot gas. If you want an explosion to happen, you have to do something very different. You have to contain the gas. So unlike using gunpowder as a propellant, if you wanna use gunpowder in a, say a mortar starburst for a firework, you would need to actually completely contain 
that gunpowder. So, it, so the expanding gas had nowhere to go. So if you contain all of that gunpowder and all of the gases that it's producing, that pressure builds up so fast, so fast that it causes whatever material is containing it, normally it's like cardboard, it causes it to rupture very, very quickly. And that's what an explosion is. It's just rapidly expanding gases and push it, those gases push out in all directions. Um, so if we go back to that summary slide, just once again, I wanna reiterate one thing with you. You know, we use materials for different purposes all the time. We use gunpowders for propellants. We use gunpowders in fireworks to cause explosions as well. And it's all in how we use the gas. So we've talked a bit about propellants now. We've talked a bit about gunpowder and how we can use it as a propellant and as an explosive. Let's start and look at how we can make them the color that we want and start to look at coloring our fireworks and how we get to a particular firework that explodes into a brilliant red flame. I, I saw at the very beginning, some of you were in the waiting room and I saw the question, you know, what makes fireworks explode and give off a red color? Well, hopefully with the next demonstrations I'm gonna show you, you'll be able to answer that question. So hopefully you are still here and paying attention and we're gonna get on into section three. So we're gonna look at what gives, what gives chemical compounds or what chemical compounds provide color and actually talk about the mechanism behind how color is produced by certain materials. And it's gonna boil down to two classifications of compounds that we typically use in fireworks. We're either gonna use metal salts or we're going to use metals, elemental metals. Now, elemental metals are different than metal salts. Um, metal salts are ions, mostly they're cations, which means they have lost electrons. Elemental metals have equal numbers of protons and electrons in their atoms. So before we get into this, uh, I, need to under, I need to let you know that the demonstration I'm gonna show you next takes a little bit of setup. So you're gonna see me moving some equipment over into the fume hood and then while we do this, Brian is going to ask you a question to think about, just to get you thinking about how light is being produced. So what I want you to think about now, as you see me kind of move the equipment over, is what do you think is actually responsible for causing the color of light, okay? So the equipment that we're gonna use, is this big tray of materials, and I'm gonna to go to the camera view here in a second in the fume hood, and we're going to light these on fire and see if we can get different colors of light to show up. Let me switch the camera view so you can see it. Now, each of these particular ions, these metal ions, because first I'm going to show you metal ions, and then I'm gonna show you what happens when we use pure elemental metal samples. I've taken each of the metal salts and I've dissolved them in a little bit of water. And then I've added in some ethanol. Ethanol is flammable. So I'm gonna light all of these on fire. And it takes a little while for this reaction to get going. So while it's going, Brian's going to put up the demonstration or the question that goes along with it. So Brian, if you want to go and switch to that question now, and we'll get, let these go for a little bit. Perfect. Well, uh, we don't want to let Phil, uh, you know, um, leave some hot flames. So, uh, so I'm going to just ask you guys this question. Um, this is a chemistry class. We want to hear what you think. What is it when we get that colored reaction, when color comes out of a chemical reaction in a firework, what part of the atom, is it the proton, the neutron, or the electron, what part of the atom is producing or emitting that color? So um, take a second to get some answers, Phil. You'll, you'll see those coming in. So uh, you can give the, uh, the reveal in a second. But while we get those flames going, we want to think chemically about how are those flames producing those different types of color? And I'll tell you a little bit of detail while we get those going. Some of them are having a little more difficulty than others, but we'll stir them up here in just a second. Um, 
each of these particular components of the atom could possibly play a role. So what do you think is responsible? Is it a proton, a neutron, or is it an electron? Now think back, especially if you've had some science classes in the past, you might be able to answer this question. So post your answer in the comments. Okay, a lot of you are saying electron. I see a lot of you saying electrons there. Uh, that's actually exactly what it is. And the reason behind this has to do with motion and energy and location. So the basic idea is this. If you take a look at this image, you might see a blue particle, that's an electron. And that's what I want you to pay attention to. And you might also see a little squiggly line, that's a photon. That's a particle of light that our eyes would detect. Now, Brian, if you can put that slide down, just so I, I wanna make sure I can kind of show people what's happening here, just using my hands. So if you imagine you've got a nucleus of an atom and around that nucleus, is where the electrons reside. Now, normally those electrons are at their lowest energy state, what we call a ground state. But if we provide them some energy, say like the energy provided when we burn ethanol, because the ethanol that I added into each of these beakers is highly flammable. It produces a lot of energy. Those electrons can take in that energy. It's kind of like if you jump onto a trampoline, you can absorb energy and then you go up higher into the air. The, in, the analogy for the electron is the electron in the ground state gets excited and goes up to a higher energy level into a position we would call the excited state. Now just, that would be like you on a trampoline jumping to the maximum height you could. You know that you're not going to be able to stay up there forever. There's a gravitational attraction pulling you towards the center of the earth. You're gonna be pulled down. In this case, the electron is feeling an attraction to the positively charged nucleus. So it's always having to fight that. No, it's only if it has enough energy that it can be farther away. So that electron is eventually going to fall back down. When it falls down, that energy has to go somewhere. And that energy gets released by that electron in the form of light. The unique thing about this is every single metal ion has a slightly different electron configuration, meaning a slightly different arrangement of where the electrons are located energetically around that nucleus. Because of that, that means that they have different ways that they can bounce around and different colors of light that result. So I'm gonna switch the camera view back and I'm gonna try and give these a stir because they still don't seem to be giving me the colors that I want, but I've got a backup plan to be able to show you those colors that they should be emitting safely. So I'm gonna Shoot the camera back here. And what we're gonna do is just stir these up. And I'm gonna start from the left with potassium. Now potassium, ethanol tends to burn with a yellowish flame. And potassium typically gives us a lilac color. Copper, on the other hand, gives us a very green color. So we get a very greenish blue color. So if we wanted fireworks that were blue green, we would use a copper salt. And actually copper is notoriously difficult to make good blue fireworks from. Next is barium. Barium typically gives us a greenish color, which I don't seem to be showing up very well. It's quite pale. Sodium gives us yellow, and sodium always works really, really well for this demonstration. You can see it's very bright orange color, orange yellow. Next is calcium. Calcium gives us a little bit more of a reddish orange hue. You might notice a difference there when I stir it. You can see that, that wood, the wood burning is always gonna be yellow, so I'm trying to stir it up so you can see that reddish orange color. Moving on to strontium. Now strontium, if I can light that on fire, should give us nice red colors. So whoever answer, asked that question at the very beginning before class even started about how we're making red fireworks, it has everything to do with strontium. Strontium nitrate is often used for reddish hued fireworks. You can see little bits of red there. And finally, we've got lithium, now lithium also gives us a reddish color. Ooh, that was quite nice. 
show you that one more time. So I can just ignite it here. We get that nice reddish color. One more time. Nice little reddish color from that flame. Now, that's colors. Those colors are just going to require us as we start to make our fireworks to think about how we mix those particular color producing agents with the gunpowder and the propellants that might be our already our main kind of foundational base of the fireworks that we make. So if we're mixing each of these different salts, these different metal salts, then they're going to be mixed in in a particular ratio so that when the explosions happen or when things catch on fire, when the fountain sprays uh, all of the products of the reaction into the air, we get the color that we want. So just as a reiteration, lithium and strontium, those ions give us red colors. Calcium gives us orange. Sodium gives us yellow colors. Sodium ions give us yellow colors. Barium gives us green. Copper gives us blue-green. And potassium gives us more of a lilac. It's very, very faint and difficult to discern. Uh, but, but potassium will give us a faint lilac color. So if we wanted to make like a purple firework, we would have to mix a red producing firework like strontium with a blue producing firework salt like copper. Now, I haven't really shown you anything about these salts yet, but there is something interesting that they all have in common. Take a look at these chemical formulas. These are the formulas that a chemist would use if we were to pull a chemical bottle from the stock room. We would see all of these complete formulas for metal salts. Now, notice metal salts is fundamentally just a metal with a nonmetal. In this case, um, metals can vary. But do you notice something that they all have in common? Take a minute and look at all of those chemical formulas. What do you notice that they all have in common? All right, you guys, yeah, you're fast. They're all chlorides. They're all chlorides. They all contain chloride. And that's actually really important because if you remember the very first demonstration that I showed you at the beginning of this lesson, I used ammonium chloride. And the only mention I made to it was that it was a catalyst. Now, catalysts speed up a reaction by lowering the activation energy. Chloride ions in particular are also really, really good at enhancing the color of light that's emitted by metal salts when they're burned. So as a pyrotechnician building fireworks, he or she would use chloride salts of metals to help add a particular color and ensure that it gave a nice bright burst of color. So in a dark night sky, the color was very, very vibrant. But fireworks don't always just change colors. Sometimes we get lots of sparks too. So let's, let's turn our attention to how we actually can make some sparks and make certain colors of sparks. Um, instead of me telling you, I'm just gonna show you. I think it's a lot better for me to show you than to do anything else. So I'm going to switch the camera view and you're gonna see me kind of extinguish the old beaker, the beakers that are still illuminated. Some of them have actually started to catch on a little bit better now, but I've shown you the colors and, I, and I'd like to move on and show you the, the metal sparking agents that we add in fireworks and pyrotechnics. So to extinguish flames like this, because we, we have to always think about how we safely do an experiment. I'm using a piece of equipment called a watch glass. And a watch glass just prevents the flow of oxygen, which is necessary for combustion for this particular demonstration. The ethanol, which is the liquid I used, will not be able to combust if there's no oxygen there. So I'm going to move carefully this huge tray out of the way, and in its place, I'm gonna replace it with some similar materials. Similar, but not exactly similar. So I'm gonna be using a Bunsen burner for this demonstration. Actually, this is not a Bunsen burner. This is called a Meeker burner. And a Meeker burner is nice because it gives us a nice wide flame and it burns very, very hot. And that's important, okay? So I'm gonna light the Bunsen burner, uh, light the Meeker burner, excuse me. 
Now, I don't know if you can see this. I'll move the camera a little closer. But that flame is very, very hard to detect. It's a very clean burning flame. This is a, a methane, methane fueled meeker burner. And what I want you to pay attention to is what you observe when I add two different forms of a material. So what we're gonna be using to produce sparks are metals. And I have a sample of one particular metal that is very common in pyrotechnics, and that's the element magnesium. Magnesium is a shiny metal. You notice how it reflects light here. It's also very flexible. I can bend it. And it's also a fuel. We can burn it. It will burn readily in air. So I thought I'd show you. Now you might want to be careful here looking directly at the camera because the brightness might surprise you. That is amazing. Oh, I can't, you guys, I am not staring at it directly because it is way too bright to look at directly. It just burns like crazy. So you can imagine how we would use this in a pyrotechnic display. If you had an explosive charge that set off that magnesium, you could very easily have some light that would just light up the day like the sun was out. Now let's see what happens when we actually take this in a powderized form and sprinkle it over the top. What do you think is gonna be different? Let's take a look and see. So I've got magnesium now in a different form. This is powderized. And I'm going to sprinkle it above the top of the flame. Did you catch that? Let me show you one more time. Now, core differences between those two reactions. Fundamentally, those were the same exact reaction, magnesium reacting with oxygen in the air to form magnesium oxide. Magnesium oxide is, I can show you, it's safe to touch. It's this white powdery material that forms as a result of that magnesium burning. But did you notice how different the response was? When it was a, when it was a strip, of magnesium, you got this extremely bright center of light production versus when you have magnesium grounds, like little ground pieces of fine magnesium, you get a brilliant kind of spray of sparks. So just to recap everything that we've learned now about kind of colors and sparking agents that we might add to forensics, big idea here is this, whether we're producing red photons of light or blinding white bursts of light. It all has to do with electrons. Electrons gaining energy from a reaction that produces heat and those electrons going to an excited state, falling back down to the ground state and emitting light in the process. With a, with an, with a metallic element like magnesium, uh, pyrotechnicians also use aluminum quite a bit. You get these great gray sparks, white sparks, kind of orange sparks. We use some iron powder Great, great stuff that makes their way into sparklers. If you've ever used sparklers, you've seen a lot of the same results that you just saw me do in this demonstration in the fume hood. So big ideas again, it's all about electrons and electrons gaining energy and then losing it. When they lose the energy, they emit light. Metal salts are responsible for producing particular colors in fireworks, and it has to do with their differing electron structures. And we also use catalysts all the time in fireworks to enhance the behavior, in this case, the light emitting quality of those fireworks. And chlorides, chloride ions are a very common material that are used as a light enhancer. So you've got some knowledge now. You know about propellants and how we can use things like gunpowder to propel rockets upward or make them explode. You know how to make them a particular color. You know how to make them add sparks. So you've got that knowledge, let's use it. Let's take that knowledge and use it. I've got a little challenge for you and Brian's gonna walk you through the setup. And while he's doing that, I'm going to move the equipment into the fume hood. 
Thanks, Bill. Yeah, we uh, Phil is the hardest ma working man in science right now, so we'll give him a, a little bit of a break while he sets some things up. Let me show you what we're going to have you do. As new experts on, on fireworks, we want you to tell us what's going to happen in this next experiment that Phil's setting up. So he's going to put together three rockets. I'll show them to you in a second. One is going to have strontium chloride in it. We know about chlorides. We've seen strontium burn earlier. Another is going to have magnesium, the one that we uh, we just saw and I think really enjoyed. And then another one, Phil mentioned sugar. It's a fuel for us to give us a, a big sugar rush. It's also a fuel for fireworks. We want to know which one of these rockets, when Phil ignites it, will produce sparks. So Phil's got it all set up and ready to go. Make your answers right now. Put those in the poll there and uh, and we'll see who's right. I'm not sure what sugar is going to do. That's the one I'm curious about. What do you guys think? I, I think you should be making predictions for all three because I'll bet you can come up with a good explanation of what you're about to see for all three. I'll give you a, little, a, a few more time, a few more seconds for some more comments to come in here. All right. I see several of you have some pretty definitive answers. You're convinced. You're convinced that you know what's going on with this. Well, let's try it. So, I'm going to light these rockets in the order that you see, starting with this one, the one that's a propellant with strontium mixed in. The next one that I'll light is a propellant with magnesium. And the third and final will be the propellant with the sugar. We're not going to be so much concerned if these little tails catch on fire. You want to be paying attention to what you see being ejected from these rockets as they launch. So here we go. Next, magnesium and propellant. <laughs> that was great. I love that one. Last one, propellant and sugar. That is amazing. I'm not, I wasn't sure anything was going to happen with that sugar, just propellant and sugar. But I guess they only need the same three things, don't they? An oxidizer, a fuel, and some sort of binding agent. Well, in this case, we added coloring to all of them. We added some coloring agents, except for the sugar one. That one is burning quite a long time. Always impressive. Oh, this is the best part of my job. Oh my gosh. Okay. That was awesome. That was awesome. Now, I've done it before. It's still amazing. Every single time I do these experiments safely. How can you not love chemistry? How can you not love chemistry? <laughs> now, how'd you guys do? Did you make accurate predictions? I mean, I, that, there were a lot of comments scrolling through there. So it was hard for me to keep up with it while I was paying attention to lighting those rockets safely and keeping myself uh, arm's length away from those particular things. But uh, um, did you make predictions correctly on all three? Yeah, okay. Some of you did. Some of you did. Good job. Good job. Hopefully a lot of you picked that it was the middle one, that middle one with magnesium. Because remember, if we want things to produce sparks, like white sparks in particular, Elemental metals, ground, finely ground elemental metals are what we use for that. So if we could go to the final summary slide for this, um, there's actually a really interesting picture with this slide that I wanna talk about because it shows you kind of a cutaway of a typical starburst mortar. If you look at the very bottom, very bottom of that mortar shell where the person's hand is, that's the propellant charge. So that's the charge that explodes and that energy is used to push the rocket, kind of that ball of material up into the sky. So you imagine if you want that firework to go really, really high, you have to have a very, very large propellant charge at the bottom. Do you notice how in the middle, there's some fuses, 
some black lines that connect to the center of that firework, those are time delay fuses. Those are important because you have to give time for that shell to be able to make its way up into the sky before it explodes. The last thing you want is for that firework to launch and immediately explode. You would put everyone in harm's way. It would not be a safe situation. So these time delay fuses are critical. Do you also notice how it's protected from the rest of the firework by cardboard? This is all by design. And if you notice, there are concentric circles of materials with different sized pellets inside. Each of those pieces might have a different component mixed in, a different color producing agent, a different composition with a metal powder. So all of those together get ignited as soon as that central core explodes into the air. So imagine how much chemistry is happening in the blink of an eye. It's fantastic. And again, basic ideas behind fireworks, you need a propellant, which is typically a mixture of an oxidizer and a fuel. You need a binder, and that, that just kind of holds everything together. And then you need some color producing agents mixed in. And that's how you make fireworks. And that's, that's the chemistry of fireworks. I think it's about photo time, isn't it? Exactly. I, uh, hopefully people were taking photos with those rockets as they burn. That's what I was doing in the <laughs> yeah. background here. That was pretty amazing. That was, that, that was my best. That was the best rocket launch in a classroom fume hood that I've ever done in my life. You've heard so, it here first, everyone. You got the best. Phil's been doing this, what, 20 years? And uh, yeah. uh, that was the best rocket launch. So I uh, would do that again. That was totally worth it. <laughs> Excellent. Same time tomorrow. Let's uh, yeah, let's let's find that out. All right, people have been waiting for uh, you know another huge component of all this. Uh, I'll be the catalyst, I guess, if I'm getting my terminology right. I to like it. Make a photo session happen faster. Uh, remember, guys, if you take a picture with Phil right now, upload it to Instagram, tag Phil. Tag Varsity Tutors, you'll be entered to win a lab coat just like Phil's. And so, uh, Phil, let me turn it over to you and uh, everybody. Let's get those selfies. All right, you guys. So we got to take some good selfies. And that relies on me not blinking. So I'm going to just stare at the camera and we'll do a couple. I'll do a couple different poses. I'll give you a little countdown so we can get it right. Okay. So here we go. First one, I'm just going to stand here. I'm just going to sit here actually. Just like this. So we're gonna, you have your cameras ready? Okay, I can see some of you. You're running into the kitchen or in the dining room. I know you're getting your camera phone right now. You need to come prepared. <laughs> All right, just go run and get it. Just go run and get it. And we'll do this here in just a second. All right, hopefully that's enough time. You ready? Here we go. First pose. Three, two, one, chemistry. No, my video did not freeze. That was actually, I practiced that a lot. So I got another one for you. This one has a prop. So if you want a prop in it, I'm gonna make a silly face for this one with my little prop. And we'll do this on three, two. Everybody ready? Okay, I see thumbs up in the comments. Here we go. One, two, three. Okay, is that good? Did you get the photo? Do you want just like a silly one? Maybe we could do a silly one. Um, oh wait, I gotta have the safety glasses one. Well, the prop one, one wasn't the silly one? Okay, let's go, let's get hey. even sillier everybody. It's all in the eye of the beholder, I guess. Goggles on, yes. Torch out, yes. I don't know if the torch, the torch isn't gonna show up very well. But I use the torch a lot with this. So we're gonna we're gonna do one more of the torch. Ready? One, two, chemistry. Okay, I hope you guys are tagging these. Just a science guy. That's my that's my handle. And varsity tutors, tag us both. Uh, I want to give somebody a really cool signed lab code just like this. Brian, do we have a slide for that? 
We will. We'll put that up in a okay. second. But people have been asking a lot of questions. I want to make sure we get a lot of time for Q and A. So oh, yeah, okay. we'll make yeah, sure everybody gets the rules. And uh, and then it's also it's linked uh, just beneath the chat there. So uh, people need information. It's uh, it's linked on the page you're on right now. Um, also, I don't know if yeah, I think we talked about this though. For those who have been coming to uh, to these classes. Varsity Tutors does now own the Guinness Book of World Records for largest ever science class. And there's a chance we beat that today. So everybody that's part of this, uh, we'll keep you posted on that. We definitely just set a record for most pictures taken with someone's chemistry teacher. This is, uh, that's, there's no way that's not a record, Bill. So thanks for being part of that. I can confidently say there's never been that many pictures with someone's science teacher at one time. So we'll, uh, we'll see if they keep stats on that. All right, people have been asking amazing questions. Um, so I, I can have fun with records all day. Phil can have fi fun with fire all day. Uh, one of my favorites actually um, came in just to show how well people were paying attention here. It was Lily who asked, I think it was during the flame colored uh, discussion, why are some colors harder to make than others? So we saw some were a little bit harder to get going than others. Why is that? Well, part of it can be due to the nature of those salts. Some salts are hygroscopic. So that just means that they'll absorb moisture from the air. And in order for the demonstration to work well, you have to have the right mixture of fuel ethanol to kind of give us the flame and the salt and not too much moisture, but some of those components just suck moisture out of the air very quickly. Uh, but in terms of like fireworks, just to, just to kind of take this a little bit further and, and speak to it in terms of the fireworks, the metal salts that we use, not all metal salts behave the same way. If you notice from that slide way back, I think in section two, they all are chloride salts, but just because they share chloride ions in common doesn't mean that they're going to have the same chemical properties and same physical properties. Now there's gonna be some overarching similarities, but some of them start to decompose and copper is one in particular. In fact, I've heard it commented on pyrotechnic chat boards that you can judge the quality of a fireworks display by the blue fireworks or the absence of them. If you see a really brilliant blue firework explode, you know that that was made. That was a prime constructed piece of pyrotechnic equipment because it is not easy to make blue. And consequently, it's also difficult to make really, really vibrant purple because you have to mix a blue component, which are typically copper containing salts with um, other kind of purpley or other red producing components like strontium. Now strontium gives you a nice good red response most of the time. It's all about copper. Copper's temperamental and fidgety as a salt. So great question. Copper's like the teenager of, uh, of metal salts, I guess, right? That's, it breaks uh, that breaks down. Makes sense. Yeah, exactly. It breaks down. So I'm going to use that. The, uh, the quality, I'm judging fireworks on Saturday, but how good are the blues? I love that. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. news we can use. Really uh, should, I mean, okay. what I was going to say is you can, I mean, what do you typically see in fireworks? You see lots of sparks, very easy to make sparks. You see lots of yellows, you see lots of greens. Greens are kind of uh, barium. Uh, you can use some, bor some boric acid for that as well. Uh, sodium gives you nice yellows all the time. Um, yeah, it's just those blues. Look for the blues. The blues are always kind of the, the unicorn in the fireworks industry. Perfect. That's that's good insight. I like that. Hey, you mentioned chlorides again. We had a few people ask, um, you know, what what is a chloride? So I think that one, again, I love that people are asking that. Uh, what is a chloride specifically? The, the most common chloride that you're probably familiar with is something called sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is table salt, common table salt. And when I use that term metal salt, all that means is you've got a cation, a metal cation, and, an, and a non-metal anion, charged particles that stick together and they form what is called an ionic compound, right? So when we, we say a metal salt of any, any kind, uh, that's just generically referring to a cation and an anion. More specifically, a chloride is going to be a metal salt where the anion is the chloride ion. And that chloride ion just happens to have some chemical properties that are catalytic in many particular reactions, meaning they speed up the reaction or they enhance the energetics of a reaction in some way, shape, or form. So chlorides are just going to be salts that contain the chloride ion. 
Perfect. Great explanation. Um, and with those explanations and insight comes another question. A lot of people, one of the most common questions, um, Grace, Jack and Isabella all um, asked this pretty recently. And I know plenty of others. So if I didn't mention your name, sorry about that. Um, how did you know you wanted to become a scientist? They, you know, they clearly didn't have these kinds of classes when we were kids. So how did you know you wanted to become a scientist? That's, that's really a fun question to answer. Because uh, I had a great chemistry teacher in high school. I loved science. I ate up science in high school. I didn't really get that much science in middle school. I got a little bit towards my seventh and eighth grade year and I loved it. I was into it, especially physical science. When I got to high school, I took chemistry. Shout out to Mrs. Cheney from Plymouth High School in Plymouth, Indiana. She got me started. She encouraged me all the way to just do things. She, she empowered me. She taught me how to do things properly and safely. And from there, the rest is history. I also had great professors at Purdue University, my alma mater, Boilermaker here. Uh, they, all, they all encouraged me as well, but it really started for me with, with one teacher. And, you know, I, I probably wouldn't be a teacher. I wouldn't be a chemistry teacher without, without her influence. So uh, never take a good chemistry teacher or any teacher for that matter for granted. You never know what kind of impact that they're going to have on your life. Well, you've got thousands of students uh, looking at one of the world's best chemistry teachers right now. So we'll have, you know, if I know multiplication, we'll have uh, quite a few chemistry superstars in about 15 years or so. So um, thanks for inspiring all of them today, Phil. Another insanely popular question. Everybody was at, you saw it in the waiting room when, uh, when people were kind of getting hyped up for class, people have been asking throughout. Um, it's kind of a combination. It's how do fireworks get their shape? And how do we determine how high a firework flies before it explodes? Okay. Now that's a little, let me try and unpack that because there's really a couple of things there. So first let's talk about how high you want it to go up. Well, first to get it a certain height, you're going to have to think about how big the firework is because it takes a lot less propellant to launch a golf ball sized mortar shell into the sky compared to a bowling ball sized uh, mortar shell, like you might see on like a professional fireworks display. But the fundamentals are all the same. You have, a, you have a propellant charge at the base, and that is going to be proportional to how big the firework is. It's a small mortar shell. You don't need as much propellant because it can safely detonate at a lower altitude than a much larger firework, which might have a much larger or diameter once it fully explodes. The core thing you have to always consider is you need to keep the observance and people observer, the observers and everyone who's in close proximity safe. And it also means you need to keep the people, the pyrotechnicians who are launching this display safe. You don't want a shell to go off too close to the ground and have the sparks fall and ignite subsequent kind of reactions that would cause something catastrophic to occur. The other question, the other part of the question dealing with shape, it's something that I'm gonna tell you, I'm not an expert in, but I can tell you that it has to do with packing. So how you pack those little pelletized pieces. And if you remember that last slide that we showed where you showed kind of the cross section of the firework, you may have noticed that they, everything was very geometric on the interior. There were lots of little circles. Oh, thanks Brian for putting that up. Uh, you see lots of little circles there. That's a typical starburst pattern. So when that one explodes in the sky, what you have to understand is it's a three-dimensional explosion. It's exploding equally in all directions. So if you wanted something to explode upwards, you would just distribute those particles in a different way. If you wanted it to explode in a different shape, you would have a different shaped charge that would detonate and cause those particular pieces. I'm sure you've seen fireworks where there's an initial explosion and then subsequent explosions. Again, you can imagine that that's just a main charge with small fuse pieces that, that delay as the additional particles are, expand, are exploding outward and then those secondary bursts happen. So talk about complicated chemistry. It's not just complicated chemistry. It's really a feat of pyrotechnic engineering that's going on here. 
So you might say that the fireworks uh, makers have fireworks down to a science, right? There's uh, to get those shapes with precision. You know, we show we showed the fireworks equation before. I'm sure there are yeah. other equations that they're uh, they're looking at when they try to make almost like balloon animals out of uh, yes. out of fireworks. It's amazingly complex. And just on a on a side note, making these fireworks takes extreme caution. You don't want any sparks nearby. You don't want any heat sources. Every like you didn't get to see any of the behind the work stuff that was done for today's lesson, but I can tell you all the work I did was in plastic. I didn't use metal materials, anything that might scrape together and produce a spark. No, and I kept compounds together only when necessary, only when it was safe to do so. And this is something that pyrotechnicians and people who produce fireworks take very, very, very seriously. And thanks for that. Yeah, fireworks safety is important. Everybody should be, you know, particularly safe this weekend. Um, There's actually a fire outside of my house on Sunday because of fireworks. Some people who uh, hadn't taken this class yet and uh, thought they were fireworks experts. So uh, we'll stress that point enough. Uh, Phil's a professional. He's got a few mood and, uh, and and all those kind of things. If you win the lab code, it doesn't mean you're quite ready to be filled just yet. It's only one step. Hey, a couple more questions for you um, that, uh, that I think, uh, you know, people have been asking so many great one. So thanks to everybody. And we'll, we'll, we'll be back next week with another chemistry lesson. If you've got more, if we didn't get to yours. Um, one, uh, one fun one I want to ask because we're close today. Uh, do you have any favorite lab mishaps, accidents in the labs or any story you have about a, uh, an experiment gone wrong? That's kind of your favorite. So there are always experiments that go wrong and sometimes they're avoidable. Sometimes Despite your best instruction and intention, things just go wrong. I can, I'll can i share a story, no names. But this was when I was an undergraduate studying to be a chemistry teacher. And I was working with a lab partner and we were dealing with a chemical, it's a pretty common chemical called acetone. Okay, acetone is commonly known as fingernail polish remover. We were working with it in a beaker, which is a safe piece of equipment to be using with acetone in a fume hood. Um, not as large as the one that I have, but you know, appropriately sized for the work that we were doing. And all it took was a split second, not paying attention. Your arm sweeps over and the beaker filled with acetone uh, got knocked over. And it got knocked over and it hit my lab partner's pant leg. And the pant leg was made out of a tracksuit kind of um, polymer material. And that polymer material we learned was soluble in acetone because their pant leg dissolved right in front of our eyes. Uh, thankfully, acetone wasn't a chemical that is, is necessarily going to harm you, but it definitely is an experience that you wouldn't want to relive again when you're in a classroom full of other students and all of a sudden part of your pants disappears in the middle of class. So yeah, that, that's one that stands out to me. Um, the other that I can share, and this is just one that happens as a result of, sometimes you do things and you're, you, don't, you don't think, you might be tired, you might be whatever. I was a new teacher teaching in Chicago and I had just done a demonstration with students. I forget the exact demonstration, but I remember exactly what happened afterwards. I ignored the fact that one of the chemicals I had used reacts violently with water kind of like the first demonstration that I showed today. Not, it wasn't the same demonstration, different one, but there's a lot of chemical compositions that are water sensitive. So I took the test tube, small test tube, threw it into my sink, which happened to have a beaker with water inside it. The test tube fell into the beaker. I turned around, went back into the classroom. All of a sudden, boom, spray of sparks. Fill this, like just shoot out of my sink. The kids in my class freak out as they should. And I was left feeling, wow, the importance of safety cannot be overstated enough. Like everything that you have to do using chemicals needs to be taken very seriously. Even things that we think are benign, we have to treat them with respect because Mother Nature 
and chemistry will teach us otherwise. The minute that we get too complacent with um, or feel like we know exactly what's going to happen. You never know exactly what's going to happen. Those are amazing stories. I, uh, I, I, I knew people had the questions. I was hoping we'd have stories, but uh, those are two winners. So, uh, so thank you. Um, hey, let's end on a high note and then everybody will put up the rules for the contest because I know people want to win the lab coat and, uh, and a little bit of a promo for next week. Um, let's end on kind of a high note. I know science for, you know, you love science. I, I think everyone watching right now loves science more than before. I think science, you know, has a reputation for being kind of a hard subject in school. Um, you know, grades can be difficult. What advice do you have for kids who like science but are a little bit intimidated about science classes in school? So for me, I, I can just kind of make this a little bit personal because I know I've already mentioned that I loved chemistry. I loved chemistry. I also had someone who encouraged me, encouraged that love of chemistry. And that might not, that's not a universal experience. I know this whenever I talk with people about their, how, what their chemistry class was like. But what I can tell you is this, if you enjoy something, don't let anyone else diminish that joy. I love chemistry. I love geeking out. I love making fireworks in the fume hood. I love doing all of those things. Now I had to work really hard and there were definitely classes that I took that I did not do so well with. I took them again. That's okay. You don't have to be too proud to, to say, okay, I, have, I still have some learning to do. You know, but if it's your passion, if it's what you love, go for it. Don't let anyone deter you otherwise. And just start getting involved now as early as, I mean, I don't know from everyone that's, that's still with us right now, what your age ranges are. But I can tell you if you're in middle school or even in elementary school, Find, find a passion, start experimenting, do all kinds of things. You never know exactly what you're gonna love without trying lots of different science experiences. Um, chemistry just happened to fit for me. And then once you find what you like, dig in, work hard, ask questions, find like-minded people who can help you because we all need to help each other in this world for education, for life in general, for everything. That's great advice, Bill. Thank you. I love the idea that, you know, one, one phrase we use a lot at Varsity Tutors is there's a word, we use the word yet. When somebody says, I'm not good at chemistry, I'm not good at math. It was, so you're not good at that yet, but, you know, every, everything is learnable and, uh, you know, and skills build over time. So um, I think that's uh, really great advice. Um, you also mentioned that, uh, you know, getting involved in science now. Um, on the page everyone registered for for this class, we have a bunch of other science camps coming up all summer, the Summer of Science series that, uh, that Phil helped us put together. So all kinds of, of science classes, if you're inspired today and uh, want to try some things, your parents are watching with you, they don't involve fire the way that, uh, that Phil did. He's a professional, but all kinds of great summer camps going on. Um, for right now, Phil, we're going to see you back a week from today to, uh, to talk about forensic science and, uh, yeah. and how we solve crimes uh, and who done it with science. So, um, so get excited for, uh, for that, everybody. And in the meantime, I hope everybody have, everyone has, I'm, I'm excited. I'm in an excited state like an electron. I'm going to come back <laughs> down to earth and emit a photon. Um, hopefully everyone has a fantastic Independence Day weekend, uh, enjoys fireworks and looks for the blues. And uh, Phil, thanks a ton for, uh, for a really exciting uh, lesson. And I said it was going to be a blast and it was probably about a dozen blasts, I think. Yeah, it was great. It was so much fun. I hope you guys had fun at home too. And definitely, hey, um, tag us again, not just in the selfie photos. I think it'd be cool if you can find a good blue firework over the 4th of July and tag just a science guy, tag varsity tutors. Let's see what you guys see as you go out and observe a safe, happy, fun, family oriented fireworks display, whether it's at home or abroad. Show us what it's like for you during the 4th of July. I think that'd Perfect. be cool. Great. I agree. Have, uh, have a great 4th, Phil. We'll, uh, we'll see you back next week. And everyone, yep. thanks for so many questions. And uh, enjoy your fireworks this weekend.